This is section 93 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the White Friars by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Address at the dinner given by the White Friars Club in honor of Mr. Clemens, London, June 20th, 1899. The White Friars Club was founded by Dr. Samuel Johnson and Mr. Clemens was made an honorary member in 1874. The members are representative of literary and journalistic London. The toast of Our Guest was proposed by Louis F. Austin of the Illustrated London News, and in the course of some humorous remarks he referred to the vow and to the imaginary woes of the friars, as the members of the club style themselves. Mr. Chairman and brethren of the vow, in whatever the vow is, for although I have been a member of this club for five and twenty years, I don't know any more about what that vow is than Mr. Austin seems to. But whatever the vow is, I don't care what it is. I have made a thousand vows. There is no pleasure comparable to making a vow in the presence of one who appreciates that vow, in the presence of men who honor and appreciate you for making the vow, and men who admire you for making the vow. There is only one pleasure higher than that, and that is to get outside and break the vow. A vow is always a pledge of some kind or other for the protection of your own morals and principles, or somebody else's, and generally, by the irony of fate, it is for the protection of your own morals. Hence, we have pledges that make us eschew tobacco or wine, and, while you are taking the pledge, there is a holy influence about that makes you feel you are reformed, and that you can never be so happy again in this world until you get outside and take a drink. I had forgotten that I was a member of this club. It is so long ago. But now I remember that I was here five and twenty years ago, and that I was then at a dinner of the White Friars Club and it was in those old days when you had just made two great finds. All London was talking about nothing else than that they had found Livingston, and that the lost Sir Roger Tickborn had been found, and they were trying him for it. And at the dinner, Chairman, I do not know who he was, failed to come to time, the gentleman who had been appointed to pay me the customary compliments and to introduce me forgot the compliments and did not know what they were. And George Augustus Sala came in at the last moment, just when I was about to go without compliments altogether. And that man was a gifted man. They just called on him instantaneously while he was going to sit down to introduce the stranger— and Sala made one of those marvelous speeches which he was capable of making. I think no man talked so fast as Sala did. One did not need wine while he was making a speech. The rapidity of his utterance made a man drunk in a minute. An incomparable speech was that, an impromptu speech, and an impromptu speech is a seldom thing and he did it so well. He went into the whole history of the United States, and made it entirely new to me. He filled it with episodes and incidents that Washington never heard of, and he did it so convincingly that although I knew none of it had happened, from that day to this I do not know any history but Salah's. I do not know anything so sad as a dinner where you are going to get up and say something by and by, and you do not know what it is. You sit and wonder and wonder what the gentleman is going to say who is going to introduce you. You know 
that if he says something severe that if he will deride you or traduce you or do anything of that kind he will furnish you with a text because anybody can get up and talk against that anybody can get up and straighten out his character but when a gentleman gets up and merely tells the truth about you what can you do mr austin has done well he has supplied so many texts that i will have to drop out a lot of them and that is about as difficult as when you do not have any text at all now he made a beautiful and smooth speech without any difficulty at all and i could have done that if i had gone on with the schooling with which i began i see here a gentleman on my left who was my master in the art of oratory more than twenty-five years ago when i look upon the inspiring face of mr depew it carries me a long way back an old and valuable friend of mine is he and i saw his career as it came along and it has reached pretty well up to now when he by another miscarriage of justice is a united states senator but those were delightful days when i was taking lessons in oratory my other master the ambassador is not here yet under those two gentlemen i learned to make after-dinner speeches and it was charming you know the new england dinner is the great occasion on the other side of the water it is held every year to celebrate the landing of the pilgrims those pilgrims were a lot of people who were not needed in england and you know they had great rivalry and they were persuaded to go elsewhere and they chartered a ship called mayflower and set sail and i have heard it said that they pumped the atlantic ocean through that ship sixteen times they fell in over there with the dutch from rotterdam amsterdam and a lot of other places with profane names and it is from that gang that mr depew is descended on the other hand mr choate is descended from those puritans who landed on a bitter night in december every year those people used to meet at a great banquet in new york and those masters of mind in oratory had to make speeches it was dr depew's business to get up there and apologize for the dutch and mr choate had to get up later and explain the crimes of the puritans and grand beautiful times we used to have it is curious that after that long lapse of time i meet the white friars again some looking as young and fresh as in the old days others showing a certain amount of wear and tear and here after all this time i find one of the masters of oratory and the others named in the list and here we three meet again as exiles on one pretext or another and you will notice that while we are absent there is a pleasing tranquillity in america a building up of public confidence we are doing the best we can for our country i think we have spent our lives in serving our country and we never serve it to greater advantage than when we get out of it but impromptu speaking that is what i was trying to learn that is a difficult thing i used to do it in this way i used to begin about a week ahead and write out my impromptu speech and get it by heart then i brought it to the new england dinner printed on a piece of paper in my pocket so that i could pass it to the reporters all cut and dried and in order to do an impromptu speech as it should be done you have to indicate the places for pauses and hesitations i put them all in it and then you want the applause in the right places when i got to the place where it should come in if it did not come in i did not care but i had it marked in the paper 
and these masters of mine used to wonder why it was my speech came out in the morning in the first person while theirs went through the butchery of synopsis i do that kind of speech i mean an off-hand speech and do it well and make no mistake in such a way to deceive the audience completely and make that audience believe it is an impromptu speech that is art i was frightened out of it at last by an experience of dr hayes he was a sort of nansen of that day he had been to the north pole and it made him celebrated he had even seen the polar bear climb the pole he had made one of those magnificent voyages such as nansen made and in those days when a man did anything which greatly distinguished him for the moment he had to come on to the lecture platform and tell all about it dr hayes was a great magnificent creature like nansen superbly built he was to appear in boston he wrote his lecture out and it was his purpose to read it from manuscript but in an evil hour he concluded that it would be a good thing to preface it with something rather handsome poetical and beautiful that he could get off by heart and deliver as if it were the thought of the moment he had not had my experience and could not do that he came on the platform held his manuscript down and began with a beautiful piece of oratory he spoke something like this when a lonely human being a pygmy in the midst of the architecture of nature stands solitary on those icy waters and looks abroad to the horizon and sees mighty castles and temples of eternal ice raising up their pinnacles tipped by the pencil of the departing sun here a man came across the platform and touched him on the shoulder and said one minute and then to the audience is mrs john smith in the house her husband has slipped on the ice and broken his leg and you could see the mrs john smiths get up everywhere and drift out of the house and it made great gaps everywhere then dr hayes began again when a lonely man a pygmy in the architecture the janitor came in again and shouted it is not mrs john smith it's mrs john jones then all the mrs jones got up and left once more the speaker started and was in the midst of the sentence when he was interrupted again and the result was that the lecture was not delivered but the lecturer interviewed the janitor afterward in a private room and of the fragments of the janitor they took twelve baskets full now i don't want to sit down just in this way i have been talking with so much levity that i have said no serious thing and you are really no better or wiser although robert buchanan has suggested that i am a person who deals in wisdom i have said nothing which would make you better than when you came here i should be sorry to sit down without having said one serious word which you can carry home and relate to your children and the old people who are not able to get away and this is just a little maxim which has saved me from many a difficulty and many a disaster and in times of tribulation and uncertainty has come to my rescue as it shall to yours if you observe it as i do day and night i always use it in an emergency and you can take it home as a legacy from me and it is when in doubt tell the truth end of to the White Friars by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman.